1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. All right, our chaplain's report today does come from the book of Samuel. We're continuing our series in Samuel. So I'll go ahead and dive right into the scripture. This passage comes from 1 Samuel 10, 9 through 12. And the only thing that you really need to know to understand what's going on here is that this is directly after the previous section of scripture that we went through where Samuel has chosen Saul to be God's anointed king. And this is after that announcement has been made. He's already been anointed king. And this is, he's not like in the palace ruling yet, but this is sort of on his journey to being king. So let's go ahead and, and look in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 through 12. Then it happened when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart. And all those signs came about on that day. When they came to the hill there, Behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily, so that he prophesied among them. It came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied now with the prophets, that the people said to one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man there said, Now who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? There's a couple of really fascinating aspects to this scripture. One is, I think that it makes very obvious, it speaks to the changes that the Holy Spirit makes on somebody. When God's Spirit comes, to, uh, comes upon a person, that change is obvious to anybody that knew them. And that's the way that it should be now. It was the way that it was in the Old Testament. It's the way that it should be in the New Testament. That once somebody has made such a big change, once God is with a person, that that makes a very noticeable difference in themselves, their personality, their priorities, all of those things. That if we are truly servants of God, if we are children of Him, if, if we serve Him the way that we're supposed to and God's Spirit is with us, then that is going to be something that other people, whether they were close to us or not, are going to notice and pick up on about us. So that's one very obvious thing. But one thing that I wanted to kind of zero in on here what exactly does it mean by God changing his heart? Because I find that really interesting. That God changed his heart. Well, I don't think that it would be a correct interpretation of Scripture because of what we see elsewhere in the Bible. To say that God intervened in some kind of very specific way to change the kind of person that Saul was. I think it's true that he magnified some of the things that were already there. But you have to keep in mind that for God to change a person's heart, which, by the way, he continues to do to this day, that for God to really change somebody's heart, he has to be invited in. That it's not as though a person is just roaming around and all of a sudden God decides, you're going to be one of my people now, zap, and then he changes everything about them. That's not what's going on here. And that's not what the scripture is trying to convey. Because God does work in a person's heart. He does make those changes. It's him doing all the heavy lifting. But it's also a heart that has to be ready to receive that. I mean, you can see that all throughout the New Testament as well, the parable of the sower, so on and so forth. But if God were to override free will, if what he was talking about here is that basically, Saul, you are now just an extension of me. You're no longer your own person. I'm just going to make you do these things. I'm going to change your heart in this way. Well, that wouldn't make sense because we know what happens in the rest of the story. We know that eventually what happens is that Saul becomes an enemy of God. He goes hunting after David. He does all kinds of evil things. If God changed a person's heart and that meant they were permanently ripped of their free will and now only served him, well, that wouldn't make sense with the rest of Saul's story. So we know that that can't be the case. Remember that when God's Spirit did depart from Saul, the reason that it did is because Saul started disobeying God, which would suggest that the human interaction between God and man is dependent upon the human. That yes, God's Spirit did come to dwell with Saul to the point that he could even prophesy among other people. 
But what also happens here is that we know that when that departure of the Spirit takes place, it's because Saul essentially kicked God out of his heart. He didn't want him there anymore. And the way that we know he didn't want him there anymore is because he did evil. God told him to do one thing. He did something completely different. Saul defied God multiple times. And God's Spirit departed from him. So if we want God to be a part of our lives, if we want his Spirit to dwell within us, That has to be something that A, he's invited to do, and B, it has to be continual. It has to be something that we're continually being obedient to God, doing what he wants, because God's not going to stay anywhere that he's not wanted. Jesus was that way. We see that Jesus in his physical life here on earth, whenever there was a place where they, they didn't want Jesus there anymore, Jesus left. I mean, he said things that were uncomfortable. He had no problem with people uh, pushing back on him. But when they were like, you know what, we're done. We don't even want to hear you anymore. What did Jesus do? He left. That happened over and over again in the Gospels. But another lesson I think it teaches us is it illustrates how much a person can change and fall out of God's favor. That's something that's very prevalent in the New Testament. Uh, It talks about falling from grace, for example, in Galatians 5, 4, indicating that somebody has received God's grace and and been the beneficiary of that can also fall away from it. And I think Saul is an Old Testament example of that. You look at Saul's life, Saul was every bit as much God's chosen, God's anointed as David was. What was the difference? David stayed faithful, Saul didn't. That was the difference. That when Saul screwed up, he didn't repent. And when he did repent, it was insincere. You'll remember that he repented when David spared his life and he said, I will not chase after you again. And then what, two chapters later, we see him chasing after David again, trying to kill him. It wasn't a real repentance. When David repented, he meant it. Now, that didn't make him perfect. That didn't mean that everything he did afterward was approved by God, but Dang it, you got to give him an A for effort. He tried really hard, and and when he repented, it was obvious. He was serious about it. Saul didn't have that. And I think it really does show the difference in the two of them that once Saul's heart turned against God, God was like, no, I'm, I'm not dwelling here anymore. I will go find somebody else, a man after my own heart. And so having the hindsight really does put this passage of Scripture into its proper perspective that Yeah, it was a wonderful thing for Saul that he got to be an instrument of God's will for a while. God gave him all kinds of blessings, all kinds of special insight, prophecy, all of that. And that was a wonderful thing that ought to be applauded. But ultimately, Saul didn't follow through. Saul became prideful and arrogant and turned against God and no longer cared what God thought and went off and did his own thing. And when that happened, God's spirit departed. So if we want to be the beneficiaries of God's blessings, we have to be a David and not a Saul. Because it's great to start out great. It's great to have those blessings. It's great to be the recipient of God's grace. But we have to be somebody that invites God into our heart, that wants him there, that does the best that we can to maintain that. Yeah, God's doing all the heavy lifting, just like he did with Saul. No amount of Saul's goodness would have enabled him to give a prophecy. That was obviously God's work. But for God's work to be done through Saul, Saul had to have the right kind of heart for him to dwell in. He didn't take him over. He didn't make him into a robot. Ultimately, what happened is Saul had to be the right kind of person to be an instrument of God's will and to be used by God. And David did that until his death. So for us to do the same thing, for us to be truly in a right relationship with God, for God to dwell with us, We have to do the same thing David did and remain faithful. Otherwise, we can do what Galatians 5.4 talks about and, and fall from grace. Let's make sure that everything that we do is trying to follow the pattern that David set, not Saul. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. 
I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.